Okay, good morning, everybody, and a restful Sabbath to you. It's a beautiful Sabbath day here in the Yosemite area, Yosemite National Park area. I'm not actually in the park because, uh, well, I think you have to make reservations like a year in advance now or something. So, but, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, Yosemite oh. really, really changed over the years. So, but uh, so I'm hanging out at the outskirts and it's uh, just beautiful country beautiful country so i praise god for that welcome to connect to hope everybody uh, this is stephen s Wynn, and i'm so happy to have you join us today on this beautiful sabbath as we praise god and study his word and so as we begin this morning uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then i'll have our good friend val uh, lead us in our theme song for today. All right, let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for who you are. Lord, we know that whatever happens here on this crazy planet, you still sit on the throne of the universe, and your son sits next to you on his throne. And Father, we're so grateful that we can praise you, that you have created our lips and our voices so that we can lift our, our voices in praise to you and in song to you. And Lord, we just uh, ask you to be with us in a special way, a meaningful way, a uh, transforming way today as we praise you and as we study your word. And I thank you and I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 All right. Okay, Val, are you ready to lead us? I am. <clears throat> My voice just went away, but yes. Okay. <clears throat> Give me a minute. There we go. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Let me get the slideshow going here. Okay. All righty. Got a, just a moment. Let's see. <laughs> Do the right buttons. Yeah, there we go. Okay, ready when you are. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> All righty, we'll sing it through twice. I'll praise my God for who he is. Amazing, almighty Father. He calls the stars of the universe and us, his sons and his daughters. I'll praise my God for what he did. He gave his only begotten. And in my father through his son, I know I'm never forgotten. I'll praise my Jesus for who he is. He is God's only son. And with his almighty father, the two in spirit are one. I'll praise my God for who he is. He amazing, almighty Father. He calls the stars of the universe and us, his sons and his daughters. I'll praise my God for what he did. He gave his only begotten. And in my father through his son, I know I'm never forgotten. I'll praise my Jesus for who he is. He is God's only son. And with his almighty father, the two in spirit are one.
Amen. 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 Awesome. Amen. Hallelujah. Praising our Heavenly Father today, our Almighty Heavenly Father. Uh, what a privilege it is to be able to do that. And that what a connection there is between praising God and what happens in our lives. Uh, for me, praising God really changes my perspective. And when God changes your perspective, it feels like everything in life changes. Uh, you know, I was just thinking this morning that God is really waiting to put a smile on my face. He loves to do things that he knows make me happy. And they could be little things, they could be big things, but as long as they're within his overall plan for his kingdom and for his glory and for my life, he will do as much as he possibly can to make me happy. And I'm noticing this in the lives of my brothers and sisters as well. And so I just praise God for that. You know, uh, we always start with uh, praise time. And then we follow that with our study time. And today for our praise time, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Psalms, if you would. Psalms. And uh, we'll go to the 104th chapter. Psalm 104. And in Psalm 104, we see a beautiful, beautiful psalm. And it really ties in beautifully with our study today of Daniel 12, verses 5 and 6. And so, uh, as we get started, let's go to Psalm 104 and verse 1. And it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And, oh, whoops, I was, I was thinking this was Psalm 103. I was going to say, and all that is within me. But uh, that's not how Psalm 104 goes. Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. How great thou art. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Psalm 104, verse 2. Who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Psalm 104 and verse 3. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Isn't that beautiful? Our, our Heavenly Father walks upon the wings of the wind. Psalm 104 and verse 4, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Verse 5, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Thou coveredst it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains. They go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. Psalm 104 and verse 10. He sendeth the springs into the valleys which run among the hills. Verse 11, they give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. Psalm 104, verse 12, by them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation, which sing among the branches. Psalm 104, verse 13, he watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. As we read Psalm 104 here, I want us to focus in on this idea of God setting a bound for the waters that they may not pass over. That is tying directly into our theme today as we study Daniel chapter 12, verses 5 and 6. And so keep that in mind, that God has set a bound for the waters. And as we as we look at Daniel chapter 12 today, we're going to see that waters represent uh, dangers in our lives. Waters represent fear in our lives. Waters represent the bad things, the challenges, the, the dangers of life. And here the promise is 
in Psalm 104, verse 9, that God has set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. And so I want you to remember today and throughout the coming week that God has set a bound for the waters in your life, for the fear in your life, for the dangers in your life, and God will not allow them to cover you, to overwhelm you. And that is a beautiful, powerful, uh, powerful promise for us today. So I'm praising God today for his power over the waters in my life. That he has set a bound that they may not pass over. He will not give me more than I can handle. And uh, as I walk through the waters, sometimes they're ankle deep. Sometimes they're knee deep. Sometimes they feel like they're about to overwhelm me. But the promise of my Heavenly Father is that they will not overwhelm me. And so what a beautiful promise. You know, I was getting my hair cut yesterday, and I took a copy of my most recent book. I thought God was disappointed in me. And I took a copy of that book with me just in case I would give it to my stylist, and which I've done several times before. And so I was sitting there waiting in the uh, waiting room and there was a gentleman next to me an older gentleman and he was very talkative he was uh he just seemed like he was he was almost talking to himself everything he was doing like with his phone he was making a comment about it <laughs> to no one in particular and so i just kind of joined in his conversation and he turned out to be a fascinating individual uh, he's a leader in he's a roman catholic and he is a teacher. He has taught various classes uh, on, I think, Bible interpretation and, um, and also some very practical classes in um, emotional health. And so uh, we, we got into a wonderful conversation, and, and I even shared the, my picture of the true God that I see in the Bible. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's so, it's so interesting that with with the message of who God is, you know, it runs all throughout the Bible. And so it's a little overwhelming to me when I talk to someone about it, because where do I start? I mean, this is just, it's, it's all through, it's like a golden thread throughout the Bible. And so um, he asked me what denomination I am. And I told him, well, I'm an original Seventh-day Adventist, because i I believe what the original Seventh-day Adventists believed, especially about God. And so I explained to him that, uh, you know, I, I don't see God as a trinity anymore. I see him as my father. Uh, and so, so instead of seeing God as a, as a committee, kind of a cold, imposing, formal committee, I see him as my compassionate father, someone who's really interested in my life. and uh, And... I told him that my father in heaven works through his son, Jesus, and that the Holy Spirit is simply the spirit of my father uh, and that he shares with his son and, and blesses me in my life. And, uh, and he was just nodding. He was nodding and smiling. And he said, oh, yeah, that's, that's so true. And he said, you know, that's really true. The, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of our father uh, and Jesus. And, but I could tell he still saw the Holy Spirit as someone other than the Father in Jesus. But the way he phrased it, it sounded to me like he was very close to understanding a biblical picture of God. And so, but more than that, I just really enjoyed talking with him. We had a wonderful conversation. And so I praise God that he gives us these opportunities to, uh, to share with people, especially about who God is. And so, what is your picture of God this morning? What are you praising God for today? Uh, who would like to share today? Maybe you have a testimony about something that God did for you this, this previous week. Uh, now is your time to share. So, who would like to begin today? Don't be shy. Anybody? Well. Okay. Good morning. Morning. 
it's a gorgeous day here in northern Michigan. Amen. And I'm super grateful for a couple hours. and flowers and i'm super thankful because so we've been camping out the last couple summers on our family orchard and the previous couple summers we've been at the north end where we're off the grid but because of largely because of my mom for the convenience it's a lot better here in the middle where we have power and there's an orchard directly across the street that gets sprayed on a regular basis but it's by other people so we don't know when they're going to spray and that's one reason we wanted to be at the north end before and um, I prayed at the beginning of the summer that it would always be a north wind when they sprayed and yesterday the third time they've sprayed and the third time it's been a north wind the whole day that they sprayed so praise God yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah my dad, after the first time, he was like, well, it's not going to always be that way. And I was like, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> that is awesome. Praise God. I was amazed and praising God for that yesterday. It was like a north wind all day. It was so amazing. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing, sister. Appreciate that so much. Yeah. Awesome. Thank I you. Have a, I have a praise. Yes, go ahead, sister. Okay. <laughs> um, as most of you know, I walk with a walker because of my balance issues. I can praise right now. I plugged my tablet in right and it's starting to charge up. Going up. That's good. I'm just so slow at learning this stuff. <clears throat> but anyway, um, my husband has rebuilt the deck, you know, put together the parts that were rotting. <clears throat> He's really good with working with wood <clears throat> and it needed painting. And he sanded it and pressure washed it and all that. So I went out yesterday and I helped him paint. And tomorrow I'll do the same thing. I, I had these uh, special um, aprons like that I could put around me and um, uh, and I got a lot of sun, which my doctor said I was low in vitamin D. Hmm. So the best way to get it is from the sun. Uh -huh. So I've been able to get a lot of sun. Today it's kind of overcast. But um, anyway, I painted and I really enjoyed it. And, and I slept well last night. If you get some, if you work hard and get some exercise, you can sleep better. So I'm thankful for, for that. And I'm thankful for all of you on here. Amen. Amen. I'm so happy to hear that, Maxine. Yeah, it's so nice to get outside and just get some uh, fresh air or semi-fresh air and um, get some exercise. And yeah, makes you feel Yeah, good. well, my garden is growing well, too. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, praise God. I'm glad to hear that. Anybody else have something to share today? Any praises, thanksgivings? Hi, um, my name is Karen. I'm Jennifer's mom. Hi, good morning, Karen. Good morning. Um, I have something to share, if I can yep. get it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like the lady who just shared what's her name uh, Maxine but, I, but um, I broke my hip my yeah, left hip a month ago mm. and um, so if I wasn't surrounded by my immediate family members Maxine I would be using a walker <laughs> <laughs> but I'm doing but I want to share this testimony about how beautiful it is here right now. And we've been able to buy some hanging flowers. Um, they're purple in yellow. And they are really bright in our surroundings. <clears throat> Plus, my daughter loves to go out and gather flowers that just grow wild. She brought yesterday, she brought home 
bunch of just stunning, sweet people. I don't know how many of you are familiar with sweet peas, but um, they're pink and shades of deeper pink and white. But anyway, I'm just trying to get my thoughts together to say what I really wanted to share. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if, oh, there they are. <laughs> what? There they I'm showing them. <laughs> oh, okay. Those are the sweet people. Um, I imagine many of you are familiar with Fanny Crosby's hymns. Mm, yes. Um, Blessed Assurance has become one of my dearest um, hymns to me. Should I hold it like that? Oh, yeah. In case. Oh, James, oh, I was holding it too close. She's holding it for me. Um, <clears throat> I've had a lot of problems with insomnia. It's improved a lot. <clears throat> but whenever I would be awake, and still in the morning when I wake up, almost every morning, the first verse of that hymn goes through my mind. And the words are so precious. But today, it was more the second verse. And it really mirrors some things I've been thinking about lately. But I'll see if I can say the words. In, <clears throat> um, blessed assurance. But that that verse starts out um, perfect submission. Mm. Um, what's the next line? Perfect submission. Perfect delight. Mm. Um, visions of rapture burst on my sight. Angel descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. And then mm. it goes in, this is my story. This is a woman speaking who's blind. In her, her, but she has what I call inner vision. Inside her mind, she has these visions of visions of rapture and rapture is a very rich word mm. um of the angels ministering to her and this has become much more real to me recently um the ministry of angels um things that i've heard on messages um about how the angels are really God's ministering spirits, as that verse says. Amen. They to us, they bring to us echoes of mercy, whispers of love. And this is how we um this is how one of the main ways we know God's love for us. Mm. Amen. Uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, now that I've come to understand who God really is. These things are so much more meaningful. These things are so much more precious to us. Amen. Amen. Um, Beautiful. Praise God. It's just, yeah, it's just amazing. <laughs> so get into your hymnals, folks. <laughs> and, and, and the other song I often think of hers is... Um, Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful one, too. Yes. So my, my vision is impaired right now. I have mm -hmm. cataracts. And so it's my hymnal and the songs I've memorized, which aren't all that many, are um, so meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just some thoughts to think about. And um, especially about how God's angels minister to us, but also just who God's spirit really is now that we know who he is. <laughs> Amen. 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 Beautiful, precious thoughts. Thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate you sharing 
and um, and praising our Heavenly Father. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, Sister, you're welcome. Sister Maxine, go ahead. Um, uh, Sister Karen, um, you can help your vision by going online and finding out what you can eat and um, that will help your vision. And there are some vitamins that I take because I have macular degeneration in one eye and my cousins had it in both their eyes. One, they both passed now and they're, they were quite a bit younger than me. But anyway, my last time I saw my eye doctor, he said, Maxine, you have 20-20 vision. And I go, well, I know I don't wear my glasses when I read. And I told him what I was doing. I was taking the eye vitamins plus lutein extra to be sure I got enough. And he said, well, keep doing what you're doing. It's working. <laughs> Amen. They so go online and find out. You can get expensive vitamins, but I just buy the cheaper ones. And then I buy the lutein extra. It's cheap. Mm. Awesome. Uh familiar with the lutein extra what was this? it's it's just um it's just an eye vitamin the one i buy it says healthy eyes it costs four dollars a bottle where the most expensive one is almost forty dollars a bottle for one month the healthy wow. eyes last for two months and the the lutein is cheap and i take it twice a day oh. to be sure it's good enough I don't know how you, I don't know what it is. So I don't know what to eat to, you know, that would, I would, that I would get it. So it's worth it. Well, thanks for the tip. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. Also, I, I bright I is an have... herb that's, that's good for your eyes, has health benefits for degenerating eyes. I've heard, yeah. I've heard of that. It's a I natural just Oh, I bright. Thank you. <laughs> I knew about it years ago. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah. I need to remind me. There you go. Yeah. Well, I um, I I was very hesitant to go for cataract surgery. I know they say you know it's a a fairly simple surgery. But somebody touching and putting something in my eyes just didn't resonate to me. I can really and I, I heard about something called Manuka honey, hmm. which has been used for to cure cataracts for hundreds and hundreds of years. Hmm. Um, so I thought, well, you know, if I don't try this, not only am I not going to benefit from it, but this could be a witness to a lot of other people. Um, we have the Manuka honey, and I appreciate your prayers that the Lord would help me get over my hesitancy to put something foreign in my eyes, which may burn a little bit the first few times, but then I, I've been told it, that it goes away. Mm. So anyway, I appreciate your prayers that the Lord would help me to stop procrastinating and getting going on it. <laughs> you you put the honey in your eyes? Yes. You can Where use you it. Get this kind of honey. Well, we ordered it online, but you can get it at an actual store too. Okay. So a natural food store. Or Maybe we should get, get your online. Maybe we should get your number and we can send you more information okay yeah, I'll, put, I'll put it in the chat okay. okay all right thanks Maxine you can also buy it from Costco oh, okay. yeah oh okay there are different different uh strengths strengths so to speak that's not the right term but or qualities qualities like there's a higher medical quality and apparently it's not like super important to have the highest one I think consistency is more important, but we did get a better one. We yeah. just need to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I would have a hard time putting honey in my eyes, I think. Hmm. I actually put honey in my eyes, so 
last summer I had gone to the eye doctor because I was having, well, I just did. And I was having um, some trouble with my eyes. And he said it was bacteria. And he said to like buy these wipes that have antibacterial. I'm like, well, I'm just going to use raw honey. So I did. And I don't think you're supposed to, it's not bad for you, but I don't think you're supposed to necessarily put the honey straight in your eyes, just like straight full concentrate honey. But I did and it burned really bad, but I think it works. <laughs> there are some recipes where you um, dilute it mm -hmm. with a couple of things like um, aloe vera juice, I've been told. And lemon juice or and lemon juice. apple cider vinegar. And you can even online, they have saline drops with Manuka honey in them. Yeah. yeah, I would say that uh, that lemon would burn your eyes worse than honey. Yeah, I, right. I think people, because there's a recipe I got from a Amish store that uses apple cider vinegar. And I think that some people, because I have a friend who knows someone at church who used lemon juice. I think they were using lemon juice instead of the apple cider vinegar. Anyway, enough talk about eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I appreciate the practical information here. Um, it's very helpful. Uh, Brigitte? Yes, uh, our eyes are yes. yes, they are definitely important. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Sister Brigitte. Yeah. Um... Uh, since the last uh, two weeks, it has been a very challenging time for me and, uh, and um, yeah, it was, it was tough and um, I was struggling with, uh, I had uh, tough decisions to take in my life and it wasn't easy at all. And I had some days which were maybe a little better than others, but then the day after uh, that would start to be tough again. I would hesitant and confident in the situation and in, in God's lead. Earlier, I had lost my peace. And uh, this Sabbath, I want to thank our Father because he gave me back my joy and he gave me back my peace and and today i feel so calm and so confident in the decisions i have taken i i praise his name for his his leading and for guarding his uh, beloved children he is always with us we count on our father so I thank him for his love and, and uh, because it's, he is the best teacher and he just takes the need, needed time for every human being to, to, to be taught uh, gently and uh, he, doesn't, um, he doesn't rush us to, to understand things and he doesn't try to, to force uh, understanding into our brain by his time and use the very perfect manner for each one of us to show us what we need to learn. And I thank you for being such a wonderful pedagogue on my praise today. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. I just love hearing how our Heavenly Father is working in our lives on a daily basis. And uh, it is beautiful. Uh, what, a, what a great testimony. Um, our plan is for next Sabbath to uh, have a testimony Sabbath. And I've asked Brigitte if she would share um, uh, her testimony of how God has led her in her life. And she has a, a wonderful uh, exciting story that I uh, know each of us will be really blessed in hearing. And so next Sabbath, we uh, plan to be having a testimony Sabbath. And so it's always a joyful experience when we share how God has worked in our lives. And so I'm really looking forward to that. 
All right. Anybody else want to share this morning? All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into our study for today then. And uh, once again, we're going to the book of Daniel and we're finishing up our study of the entire book of Daniel. And it's been quite a journey and I've really enjoyed uh, the input that uh, each of you has shared. The ways that God has taught me uh, through each one of you uh, is just a, it's a beautiful thing. I'm very thankful for that. And so as we begin our study this morning, I pray that, um, that uh, uh, God will bless us with a clearer picture of who he is. And so let's just bow our heads for a moment and ask him to do just that. Our Father in heaven, we want to praise you today. And we want to lift our voices in praise and adoration to you because you richly deserve it. And Father, you deserve so much more praise than we can actually give you. But we know that our praise puts a smile on your face and it redirects us to focus on what we really need to focus on, and that is you. And Lord, as we begin our study this morning, I just pray that you will speak to us in a transforming way through your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, everybody, let's turn in our Bibles to Daniel and the book of Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. And uh, we are looking at verses 5 and 6 today. Daniel chapter 12, verses 5 and 6. And so let me bring that up on my screen here when the Zoom menu goes away. If it goes away. <laughs> Let's see here. Go away, Zoom menu. <laughs> All right. Anyway, well, uh, Daniel chapter 12 and verses 5 and 6. All right, who would like to read that for us this morning? Daniel 12, 5 and 6. I can read. All right, appreciate you, brother. So Daniel 12, verses 5 and 6, right? That's it. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood, uh, there stood other two, um, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? All right. Thank you very much, Brother Andrew. And uh, as we uh, look at the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, I want to just remind ourselves of the big picture here. So Daniel just had a long, detailed vision that God gave him through his angel Gabriel. And this, this vision actually began back in Daniel chapter 10. And so the, the vision of Daniel 11 is actually beginning in Daniel 10, and it ends in Daniel 12. And so it's a fairly long vision that takes up three chapters of the book of Daniel. And so um, as we look at verses 5 and 6, um, God has just revealed to Daniel, he's finished the vision of Daniel chapter 11. And in, in the vision, of course, Dan, of Daniel 11, God revealed to Daniel what would happen to God's people in Daniel's future in the future for the prophet Daniel. And so uh, God has revealed the rise of kingdoms. He's revealed the fall of kingdoms. He's uh, revealed many details about what has happened, uh, especially on the political scene uh, throughout the history of the world. And so here we are at the very end of the, Dan of the vision and in verse 4, Daniel 12, verse 4, God tells Daniel to shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. 
Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about what that means, that, you know, in 1798, the 1260 years of, of papal persecution of God's people uh, took place. And in 1798, the end of the, that period of persecution took place. And so, as we know, that those 1260 years were a time of tremendous darkness for planet Earth. And that's why we call them the Dark Ages. But when those Dark Ages ended, then light began to uh, rise again for planet Earth. And God began to reveal to people who were who are searching uh, light and, and uh, new perspectives and insights uh, from the Word of God from the pages of the Bible. And we know that just following the Dark Ages, there in the early 1800s, there was a general revival. Uh, people were going back to the Bible. Uh, people were looking at the original Bible languages, Hebrew and Greek. And there was a general uh, revival. And then out of that time, then the Advent movement arose. And so, uh, so many shall run to and fro. And we we discovered a couple of weeks ago that that means that when the dark ages ended, people were free once again to study the word of God for themselves. And so they were running to and fro throughout the scriptures. They were analyzing the scripture uh, with new light and with new revelations. And so many would indeed run to and fro and knowledge, especially knowledge about who God is, would be increased. And, you know, one of the uh, specific reasons that God raised up the Advent movement was to reveal that uh, Jesus is the literal Son of God. That is uh, one of the specific ways that God, uh, the, one of the specific reasons God raised up our Advent movement. And, uh, and so <laughs> that is one of the uh, commissions of the Adventist Church, and uh, and sadly that is not being um, it's not being followed through with with the official organization, and that is a sad sad thing. But we can rejoice that God has revealed this truth to a remnant of the remnant, and uh, we we know that Jesus is the light of the world, and so. Uh, knowledge would be increased at the end of the 1260 years. That is, a knowledge of Jesus Christ as the light of the world, as the Son of God, would be increased. And so that uh, part of the prophecy of Daniel 11, as well as every part of the prophecy of Daniel 11, was fulfilled in every detail. And now in verses 5 and 6, as our brother Andrew read, uh, Daniel is now looking, and it says, Behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. What I would like to do today is present to you some facts from the scripture, and I would like you guys to contribute what you think those facts mean. And I want you guys to... Um, to be listening to the voice of God as he reveals to us just what these facts mean and how we can apply them to our lives and become more like our Heavenly Father today. And so the first, the first question I have for you is, who are these other two, these other two beings who Daniel saw? Any ideas? Who are these other two standing on each side of the river? Sister Maxine, did you have a response? Actually, I had a thought before okay. you asked the question, but I'll answer the question. I think they're angels, but my thought before you asked the question was that um, it sounds like one of the third angel's messages. Mm. However... I'm I'm not I'm not sure I'm just I'm kind of guessing 
But I think the one clothed in linen might be Christ. Mm, okay. I think you might be on to something. And I appreciate that very much. Uh, any other thoughts on who these other two are that Daniel saw? Okay, so Sister Maxine says that they're angels. And uh, let's, let's look at, um, let's go back to Daniel 10, because that was the beginning of this vision. And so in Daniel chapter 10, we see the beginning of this vision. And um, in the first few verses here, we find an answer from the Bible to our question who these two other uh, beings are. And so let's look at uh, Daniel 10, verses 12 and 13. Who would like to read those? Daniel 10, 12, and 13. I can read it. All right, appreciate it. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to the and to chasten thyself before thy God, <clears throat> thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Okay, appreciate that very much. All right, so the one of these beings told Daniel that Michael had come to help him. And so we know that this these beings were uh, actually interacting with human beings, with leaders, world leaders, and and then Michael came to help them. So it really sounds like they would be angels. Um, and now I think verse 16 really makes it clear who these beings are that Daniel saw. Daniel 10 and verse 16. Who would like to read Daniel 10 and verse 16? Daniel 10, verse 16, anybody? I, I could read it. All right, appreciate it. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips when I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O oh my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. Okay, thank you. All right, so that makes it pretty clear. So it's what these beings were, the Bible says, like the similitude of the sons of men. And so we know in other places in the Bible that the sons of men um, and the sons of God, uh, one of the groups of sons of God is, is definitely angels. And so I think it's pretty clear that uh, these two that Daniel saw were indeed angels. Well, right. I, ha I have a question. Um, sure. It says, and behold, one, like the similitude of the sons of men, touched my lips. Mm -hmm. So it's not saying a son of God, but a son of men. But mm -hmm. we know it's a divine being, mm -hmm. right? And then mm -hmm. it says, and spake and said, and said unto him that stood before me, O oh my Lord. So he mm -hmm. called him Lord. Mm -hmm. Right? And there was no Lord but Christ. Very good point. Very good point. So, so was that Jesus? I mean, by the vision, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. Mm -hmm. So... Because it says, then I opened my mouth. So Daniel opened my mouth and spoke and said unto him that stood before me. Right? So he's saying, I opened my mouth and I spoke to the one before me. 
and I called him Lord. Mm -hmm. So the angels, um, you know, I know I've said this before, I've seen an angel before, you know, mm -hmm. and they do have human-like features. I mean, but, um, but I don't know. I think that this Jesus is the, Jesus took the full form of man. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it kind of seems to me that this might be Christ. Mm. Because can, can, can we call an angel Lord? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, one uh, thing that we need to keep in mind is the word Lord can be either an address to a divine being, as in the Father or as in Jesus. Or it can simply mean master. And so uh, we know that when the Greeks came to the temple and they asked Philip uh, to see Jesus, that uh, they actually called Philip Lord. And so uh, we know that Philip was, of course, not divine. But these uh, people called him Lord because they realized that he could do something for them. So he stood in a position of authority uh, for them. And so, uh, so it, it's, it's quite possible that when Daniel said, oh, my Lord, uh, he was not necessarily speaking to Jesus, but to the angel. Okay. Um, and, that, and, and, I do, and I do recall that, you know, um, when... Christ sent the two angels to Sodom, you know, that um, the men that, you know, that the, uh, what do you see, the locals recognized them as men. They mm -hmm. said, give us those men that have entered your home. Right. So the angels do appear to be like men. Exactly. Exactly. And, but we know that they aren't men. Right. Because it tells you it's the, they one like the similitude of the sons of men. Exactly. Meaning they are not men, but they look like men. Exactly. They have the appearance of men. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very good point, brother, that, uh, you know, angels may look like men. They may have some of the uh, features of men, but they didn't, they are not actually human beings. And uh, they are created beings uh, that are above human beings. And so, uh, but Jesus actually became a man. And no other being has ever done that. No other divine being or even created being uh, has become a human being. And so we can praise uh, Jesus for doing that. And uh, we can praise the Father for his deep love in giving us his son to become a man. And so, yeah, what a powerful point. Beautiful. Sister Maxine, you had your hand up. I'm, I'm not, I can't remember now what I was going to say. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just listening. Back. All right. No problem. Okay. So Daniel sees these two beings and one being is on one bank of the river and the other is on the other bank of the river. And as I was preparing for today, I was intrigued by the, by the thought of what does the bank of the river symbolize? Is there some spiritual significance to the bank of the river? And I want to look at this word bank, as in riverbank. And then I want to look at the, uh, the word waters of the river, and then the word river. And uh, there are some powerful, powerful spiritual lessons here. So, so let's take a look at this bank of the river. How, how does the Bible use the bank of the river? We, uh, when we look at the Hebrew word from which this word bank comes from, is we find that it is the Hebrew word safa, safa, and it actually means a lip, as in a lip, 
And this was very surprising to me. Um, this Hebrew word can be translated to open the lips, as in to begin to talk. Uh, it can mean to enable to speak. Um, we read, we just read in Daniel 10, verse 16, uh, that Brother Andrew read that the angel touched Daniel's lips, which enabled Daniel to speak. So here's a, a real live example of the word bank and the Hebrew word from which it comes, meaning uh, a lip or to enable someone to speak. Um, this word can also mean futile and foolish words or empty words. And it can also mean a language or a tongue. And in Genesis 11 verse one, it says that the whole earth was of one language. All right, this is all in the meaning of the word bank as in riverbank. And uh, I had no clue that uh, the river or this word bank would include so much. But uh, it, the word bank also comes from this Hebrew word that means uh, the edge, the border, the boundary. And that makes sense. A river bank is the boundary uh, or border of a river. Um, it can also be the edge or border of a vessel. And, you know, you, you know, we have some teacups where we have the, the cup has a lip on it. And so it's the lip is where you put your lips when you take a drink. Um, this word also can mean the edge of a garment, which is interesting. Uh, this would be specifically the, uh, the neckline of the garment, as in the, uh, as in the hole in the priestly robes that uh, God instructed Moses to give to his brother Aaron and his sons. And so this word can also be the edge or boundary of a river, of course, or the sea. Now, in Genesis 41, we have uh, Pharaoh's dream. Remember Pharaoh's dream? He, he dreamed about seven uh, cows, seven uh, fat cows, and then seven skinny cows and the skinny cows ate up the fat cows and then pharaoh dreamed of the corn where um and of course these uh, these symbols represented the years of famine the years of plenty and then the years of famine and it's very interesting where pharaoh was standing in his dream and so let's read this about pharaoh's dream in genesis 41 and i'd like to have someone read Genesis 41, verses 1 through 8. Genesis 41, verses 1 through 8. And who would like to read that for us? Genesis 41, 1 through 8. I could read it. I appreciate you. Genesis 41, 1 through 8. And then just side note, my last name is Rivera, which actually means uh, riverbank. Oh, wow. Shore. Wow, interesting. Huh, cool. So there's 40, and there's 41. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and, and fat-fleshed, fat -fleshed, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river. And the ill a favored and lean flesh kind did eat up the seven well favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. And he slept and dreamed the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof, 
And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome very All right. much. All right. So where was Pharaoh standing in his dream? <clears throat> on the bank of the river. Interesting. All right. You're right, Maxine. And where did the seven kine or cows, uh, cattle, come up and stand? In verse 3. Mine says the brink of the river. Yes, yes. And that word brink is another word for uh, bank of the river, uh, which I believe is the same Hebrew word. Let's see. Yes, yes. And so, all right. So we're starting to build a picture of how the Bible uses the bank of the river. Pharaoh was standing on the bank of the river. The cows were standing on the bank of the river. Now, the River Nile was extremely important to the Egyptians, and um, they thought very, very highly of the Nile if they didn't worship it. Um, I think I had heard that they had worshipped it, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody. But um, they, they thought very highly of the, of the Nile River because they believed that the Nile was the one who gave them everything for their life. And it, you know, it really, it really was true that uh, a lot of life comes from a river in an area. You know, when you uh, go to a new uh, unpopulated land and you want to start a community, the first thing you look for is water, um, because you have to have water to survive. And water, uh, you know, does many things. It it gives you uh, drinking water, cooking water. Uh, it helps the crops grow. Uh, it feeds the animals, uh, or it, you know, it nourishes the animals, and so you really need to have water. So, uh, for Pharaoh to stand on the bank of the river, this river that he believed gave him life, uh, was I think very, uh, it was very uh, significant. And so, of course, we're gonna we're going to talk. A little later about when God told Moses to strike the the waters of the river with his rod and it would the water would turn to blood and so uh, but I don't want to give it away so we're gonna that's gonna come up here in a couple minutes so uh, another let's look at another place in the Bible where it talks about the bank of a river and let's go to Exodus 2 verses 1 through 6. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And could I, could I get someone to read that for us? Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Exodus chapter 2, 1 through 6. Who's got that? I can read again if no one wants to. All right. I appreciate it. Exodus 2. I'm almost there. One second. Mm -hmm. One through six. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no, not longer hide him, she took him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with the slime and with pitch. And put the child therein, and she laid it in the, the flags by the river's brink, or bank. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughters of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she went, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child and behold, the babe wept and she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews children. All right. Thank you, brother. 
Yep. So where did Moses' mother hide him at the river? On the bank. On the river's bank. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So she laid it in the flags, it says. And the flags are simply the like the bulrushes. And um, yeah, so very interesting. Isn't it interesting how the man whom God would use to turn the water of the Nile, which was the source of life for the Egyptians, uh, he, God would use him to turn that water to blood. And here he was as a baby resting his very life, uh, depending on that same river, uh, right there by the riverbank. It's very intriguing. All right, let's look at... Uh, let's look interesting, at interesting that he came from his lineage is from a priesthood. Mm. You know, both yes. his mother and his father mm. are from priesthood lineage. Mm. You know, the Levites. Very interesting. Yes. Yeah. So he was really a, a PK, a preacher's kid. <laughs> it, it ran in the family. Yeah. Ran in the family. Interesting. Uh, Benjamin, good to have you with us, brother. Go ahead. Hey, how's it going? Hey, um, so I was been listening and um, the story of where the man stood uh, that was in, in Lennon. He was also, um, I guess, on the bank, right? Mm -hmm. uh, did I hear that yeah. right? Okay. Well, well, the man in Lennon was above the waters. It yeah. was above the waters. Okay. Yeah. But, but the, the man that, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, the two that Daniel saw... Um, before it talks about Jesus, um, the two were standing on the riverbanks. Yeah. Okay. So the angels. That's what it is. So I see it uh, as a place of authority. Hmm. Hmm. Because, um, yeah, like, so Pharaoh, he was a man of authority. Mm -hmm. Daniel, um, the two angels there. Mm. And then even, uh, did I say Pharaoh already? Yeah, I said Pharaoh. And then now Moses. So I don't know. I just, I thought that was interesting. That was very interesting, brother. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So the Pharaoh was a man of authority and he was standing on the riverbank. Uh, the angels, of course, are of authority. They were standing on the riverbank. Um, and even Daniel, you could say, uh, was a man of authority as a prophet, prophet of God. And he was standing on the riverbank when he had this vision. And even baby Moses, who would grow up to be a man of great authority uh, in, God's, in God's leading, uh, he was, as a baby, he was there near the riverbank. That is so interesting. And as I don't want to give it away, but I think it's, we, I want to make sure and mention this, that, um, you know, when Daniel next sees the man in linen, the man in linen is above the waters. So he's not on the river bank, as were the angels and Pharaoh and, and all the rest, the, the angelic and the human people of authority. But Christ, Jesus Christ, is above the waters of the river. He's not on either of the banks. He's above that. And I think that is that is so uh, such a powerful point. Um, let's go with that in mind. I want to look at Matthew chapter 28. And if someone would look up uh, and read Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. That would be great. Matthew 28, verse 18. I have that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Amen. Amen. So the word power here can also be authority. And so all power, all authority is given to Jesus in heaven and in earth. Now, I want us to keep in mind that this verse comes directly before the Gospel Commission in verses 19 and 20. 
And so, and Jesus actually says in verse 19, go ye therefore, therefore, because I have all authority, because all authority is given to me, go and preach the gospel. And so for people to use verse 19 as a support for the Trinity is just, it doesn't work. It's, it's not consistent because <laughs> right there in verse 18, Jesus said, all power is given to me. He didn't say that, that I'm co-equal with uh, the Father and with the Holy Spirit. He said, all power is given to me. Now, if all power was given to Christ, somebody gave that power to Christ. And who would that be? Who gave Jesus his power? Anybody? His father. Yes. Amen. My friends, this is exciting. This tells us who God is. So Jesus's father gave Jesus his power, and Jesus has all power in heaven and in earth. So there cannot be three co-equal, uh, co-existent beings that form, that make up God. It's the Father who gave all power, who shares all his authority with his Son, Jesus Christ. And that's it. And, uh, and it's because of that relationship, that transfer of power from the Father to his Son, that you and I can go and preach the gospel and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of their Holy Spirit. And so Jesus has all, the pow all power in heaven and in earth. And that's why Daniel sees him, not on the riverbank, but above the water. Above the water. And I think that is so significant. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little more here. Uh, Sister Maxine, go ahead. Okay. Um the uh, scripture um, Acts 2 20, 38 then Peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the mm -hmm. remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost Amen. it's a gift Amen. it's not a third person hmm interesting but I wanted to also um Say, uh, Jesus said at the, the woman at the well, if you knew who you were talking to, you would receive living water. Mm. And, and it goes on. But mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, there is a lot of places in the Bible that talk about Jesus and water. And it's very interesting that water in the Bible can symbolize the Holy Spirit. And uh, we know that from John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. The Holy Spirit is represented by water. And uh, the water comes from the rock. The water does not exist separately. That, uh, you know, the water that God gave to his people, uh, it, it didn't exist separately from the rock. It came from the rock. And so we see a beautiful picture of, of who God is there. Well, he said to the woman at the well, if you knew who you were talking to, you, if you would receive rivers of flowing water, something like that. Living water. Yes. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Very good point, Maxine. All right. So in, you know, there's a lot of controversy about Matthew 28, verse 19. Um, that talks about the three baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and, and of the Holy Spirit. Um, we know there are three persons uh, in the Godhead, and we need to understand what a person is. A person is an agency. Uh, there are three agencies of, of the Godhead. Um, there are not three individuals of the Godhead. There are not three thinking, acting individuals in the Godhead. Uh, there are two thinking, acting individuals. And then the third agency of the Godhead is the Holy Spirit, 
which is uh, Romans 8 verse 9 tells us that the spirit, it is the spirit of God and the spirit of Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. And just like Jesus is the ultimate, ultimate manifestation of truth, Jesus is the ultimate manifestation of life. So also Jesus is the ultimate manifestation of the Spirit of God. And so that's why we say that Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Bible says that in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, and other places. And that's why Ellen White said that. She said those exact words. That is an exact quote. We want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ. And that is in a letter. Uh, it's called Letter 66, written in 1894. And it's in paragraph 18 of that letter. And that is a letter that Ellen White wrote to W.W. W. Prescott um, and telling him late in her ministry that Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. He's the ultimate manifestation of the Spirit of God. And so in Matthew 28, verse 19, when it talks about baptizing in the, the, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about three names there. We're talking about one name because we have one God. And we see there in this verse that how salvation comes to us. It starts with our Heavenly Father, and it goes through His Son, Jesus Christ. And it is manifested in our lives by Jesus Christ living inside of us as the Holy Spirit. And so two individuals, three agencies. Two individuals, three persons. And so we really need to understand what persons uh, are, are talking about. But, uh, you know, in Matthew 28, verse 18, the very first the verse before that, it really clears it up, and it says that the Father has given all authority to his Son. And so there are two individuals uh, of the Godhead, and then there is a third agency. And, and so Jesus Christ is that third agency uh, when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And so... It's a, it's a beautiful picture of, of who God really is, and it's really the foundation of the gospel. It's really the foundation of the gospel, who God is. All right. In uh, Exodus 7, we see the story of when Moses and Pharaoh met. And if I could have someone read that, it's only two verses, Exodus 7, verses 14 and 15. Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Who would like to read that? Exodus 7, 14 and 15. I can read it. Thank Go you. Ahead, Sister Maxine. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuted to him the people. He, he refused to let the people go. <clears throat> Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out unto the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's bank against, against he come. And the rod, this is, and the rod which was turned to the serpent shalt thou take in thine hand. All right. Thank you. All right. So God told Moses to meet Pharaoh where? In verse 15. By the river's bank. To the, yeah. On the river's bank. Interesting. Uh -huh. All right. Because that's where uh, the authority was, right? As our brother Benjamin mentioned a few minutes ago, the river bank is where people of authority stood. And uh, what a powerful point that is. Now, oh, I guess the way I read that, I didn't understand it. Uh, 
it's the way he came. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, Pharaoh was, I think it's likely that Pharaoh was used to going out and standing on the bank of the river and worshiping. Um, and he may have done that, you know, every morning. I don't know. But um, it says right here, God was basically telling Moses, look, Pharaoh's going to come out to the river bank as he usually does. And so you go there to the river bank to meet him. And this is where you're going to get an audience with the, with the Pharaoh. <clears throat> and um, so, yeah, very interesting. Now in, uh, let's see. Let me have someone read verses 16 and 17. Exodus chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. I can read it. And thou shalt say him, the Lord God of the Hebrews, unto thee, saying, let my people go, they may serve their to thou shalt know that I am what is in the river, and they shall be turned. All right. All right. Thank you, sister. We are having some trouble hearing you there. You were breaking up pretty bad. And yeah. So thank you for reading that, Sister Jay. Um, we're having real a lot of trouble hearing you. At least I am. So I'm going to read those verses um, here. Exodus 7, verse 16. Thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. In other words, up until now, you haven't been listening. <laughs> and so verse 17, thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So why did God have Moses, or why did God change the water of the Nile and all of its ponds and tributaries and, and all of the water of the Nile to blood? Why did he do that? What was his reasoning? It's my understanding that the Egyptians served and worshiped just about every and anything to include the waters, everything that lived in the waters. Um, they, they were steeped in idolatry and, and everything was, was just a God to them, including the water. Amen. Amen. Yes, very good point. And so the Egyptians thought that it was the Nile, the river Nile, that gave them their life. Mm -hmm. yes. And so here the Lord, Jehovah, is saying, in this you shall know that I am the Lord. In this you shall know that I am the one who give you your life. I have given you all life through my son, Jesus Christ. I've given you my Holy Spirit of life through my son, Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so the Lord was really teaching the Egyptians who he is. And, uh, and it's so interesting that uh, the waters were turned to blood. There is a verse in John or 1 John chapter 5 that I'd like to go to. 1 John chapter 5. And if I could have someone read 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. 1 John 5, verse 6. Who's got that? I have it. Thank you. And this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness 
because the spirit is truth. Amen. All right. So how interesting is that? So Jesus came by two things. He came by water, but he also came by blood. And John was very insistent to note that Jesus did not come by water only, but by water and blood. So what do you think is the connection? Is there a connection here between the water of the Nile being turned to blood and Jesus coming by water and blood? What do you think? Any thoughts on that? It was almost like a foreshadowing of what was to take place thereafter. Hmm. Interesting. Very good point. Very good point. And so, yeah, we're talking about this concept of life, how the Egyptians thought that life came from the Nile. But here in 1 John 5 or 6, uh, as you were saying, Brother Benjamin, this seems to be a foreshadowing of the real way that human beings receive life from God through his son. And that life is the spirit of the father that he gives to us through his son, the three agencies of the Godhead. So what a beautiful prophecy that was of God turning the water to blood. He was showing the Egyptians, not only where they got, got their physical life, but where humanity gets its eternal life. So that's... I also saw something else there. Um, mm -hmm. What did Moses do in order to turn the water into blood? Mm -hmm. What instrument did he use? Right. He used a wooden rod. Right. Was Christ not crucified? on a tree amen wow. wow that is beautiful hmm. praise the lord sister jay go ahead and then maxine you know i'm also reminded of that scripture that's found in leviticus 17 it yeah. may not be related but it says for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for the souls, for it is the blood that makes the atonement for the soul. So mm -hmm. even, even though per se, you know, the blood on the water um, may not be related per se to this scripture, we know that there is life in the blood and that blood does refer to Christ. Amen. Amen. Powerful. Powerful point. I love that. Uh, Sister Maxine, go ahead. I put my hand down. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we won't call on you then. All right. So how interesting. Okay. So, so far we, we have the two beings, angels on each bank of the river. And now we'll look, we'll talk about this man clothed in linen. We already know that this is Jesus. And so we're moving to Daniel 12, verse 6. Uh, it says, And one said to the man, clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? All right. So which was upon the waters of the river? First of all, I want to spend just a couple moments on this idea of being clothed. linen. So the word clothed comes from the Hebrew word labas, and it means to put on a garment, to clothe oneself with a garment. And there's actually a play on words here in the Hebrew language uh, when it comes to this idea of being clothed. And we see an example of this in Job 29 and verse 14. And would someone like to read that for us? Job chapter 29 and verse 14. <clears throat> Job 29 and 14. Who's got that? Job 29 and verse 14. Anybody? Anybody? I'll read it, Job 29, 14. 
I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was a robe and a diadem. All right. Thank you. So I put on righteousness or I clothed myself with righteousness and it clothed me. So in other words, we have, I am covered without or on the outside with righteousness and within it wholly fills me. Now, Christ is our righteousness. Righteousness is something more than just right doing. The heart of righteousness is Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus came as our righteousness, as the Messiah, and lived with us. He lived with us as the Messiah. That was Jesus as our righteousness. You know, when Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized, uh, Jesus told John, he, he said, don't worry about it. This doesn't look right for you to baptize me, but this has to happen in order for righteousness to be fulfilled. In other words, for me to do my, my uh, ministry, for me to be like uh, human beings, for me to know what it's like to be a human being in every way, I need you to baptize me and righteousness will be fulfilled. And, but here's the beautiful thing that Christ not only lived with us, but Christ now lives in us if we want him to. And Christ living in us is the Holy Spirit. It's the third person of the Godhead. It is the spirit of truth. Jesus said that uh, in John 14, 6, he said, I am uh, the life. I am the way and I am the truth. And so the spirit of truth would be the spirit of Jesus. And so when we have the Holy Spirit in us, that means that we have Jesus Christ not only living with us, but in us. And we must have Jesus living in us. And on a practical level, what that means is that I need to have what I want changed. I need to want what Jesus wants. That is the Spirit of Christ living in me. That is having the Holy Spirit. I desperately need that. that uh, I, I desperately need that every day. I need for Christ to abide in me and be the Holy Spirit. So Christ lives uh, with us. So he's, Christ, he's our righteousness on the outside. And if we let him, he will, be, uh, he will fill us with his righteousness on the inside. Uh, or the Holy Spirit. And uh, what a beautiful promise that we can have Christ abiding in us. Go ahead, Sister Jay. You know, when you think about linen, you think about it is a very expensive material mm. and mm. it is a pure material. It's mm. not mixed with anything else. It's up there. Fine linen has been associated with things like gold, silver, pearl, silk, fine wood. It's a very expensive material. And it is usually most often always worn by royalty. Mm. And it was always used in the service of the high priest. When you, mm. when you look in uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the, um, the priest's garments were always made of linen. The whole entire garment, all the garments were made of, of linen. So it's not a cheap, flimsy material. Um, it, it is uh, something that has definite value. And we know that Christ was wrapped in, in linen at his burial. Um, so... It, it is most appropriate that our Savior would be arrayed in a fine linen. Mm, beautiful, gorgeous, beautiful Jesus. I love it. 
Praise the Lord for that thought. Uh, linen, white linen. Uh, you know, also to be fully clothed. Uh, the word clothed means in the Hebrew to be fully clothed. And the first verse that pops into my mind is that verse about the when the uh, Jesus healed the demoniacs and they were sitting at his feet fully clothed and in their right mind. So inside and out, Jesus had cleansed them. He had totally transformed their lives inside and out. And that is what he must do. And that is what he's waiting to do in each one of our lives. And so I just encourage you right now to just ask Jesus, do it. <laughs> I want you to be my righteousness on the outside, my external behavior. But I also want you to be uh, my righteousness on the inside. I want to be fully clothed in you, Jesus, in that pure, clean, white linen. And so I encourage you to do that right now. As we go into uh, the concept of this, uh, the river and the waters of the river, this is just fascinating. The waters of a river in the Bible uh, we're running short on time, so we're not going to look these up. But in Psalm 88, verses 14 through 18, Psalm 88, 14 through 18, the Bible talks about waters representing an abundance of something. So waters represent an abundance of something. In Psalm chapter 18, Psalm 18, verses 13 through 18, Psalm 18, 13 through 18, the Bible uses the waters to represent great dangers, great dangers. And in Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, Joshua 7, verses 1 through 5, the Bible talks of waters symbolizing fear, the fear we have of various people and of various things in our lives. So, the waters of a river symbolize abundance, they can symbolize great dangers, and they can symbolize fear. <clears throat> now, as we go on here, we ask the question, what does a river symbolize? And uh, when we look at the Hebrew word for the word river, we find that it is an Egyptian word. And it is used almost exclusively of the Nile River. So in the Old Testament, when you see the word river, most of the time it refers to the Nile. And, uh, and of course, as we were talking about before, the Egyptians worshipped the Nile. And they believed that it gave them life. And God, of course, gave them the lesson of waters turning to blood to help them see that uh, it wasn't the Nile that was giving them life. It was him who was giving them life. And through the blood of the atonement of his son, they would receive not only physical life, but eternal life. If, if they accepted him. And so, uh, so here we see that the waters represent uh, the dangers and the fear in our lives. And the river represents uh, the Nile. And it makes us think about Egypt in uh, in itself. Now, in Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2, uh, the, the beginning of the Ten Commandment law, God says that he brought his people out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And so, we could say that the waters of the Nile represent slavery to sin, it represents depression. It represents anxiety. It represents the things that hold us down. It represents slavery to sin. It represents addiction. And so Jesus, as we mentioned, in Daniel's vision, was not on the riverbank. He was not in the water, but he was above the water. He was above the water. Now, it's interesting to think about the times in the Bible when 
Jesus was above the waters. In uh, Matthew chapter 14, we read the story of Jesus walking on the water. He walked on the sea to go to his disciples. And then, of course, Peter walked on the water. And the Bible says that Peter walked on the water, not just to walk on the water, but he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So Jesus is here above the water. He's walking on the water. He's not swimming. He's not waiting. But he's above the water. And Peter is walking to Jesus. And in the process of going to Jesus, he does something that he could never do otherwise, walk on water. And so what a beautiful, beautiful thing to realize that we can be perfect. We can achieve perfection only when we are going to Jesus, when our focus is on Jesus. Now, we can walk on water as long as we're going to Jesus. But the minute we start looking at ourselves and start thinking that our perfection comes from, uh, from us, then we're going to start sinking just as Peter did. And so we can walk on the water. We can be perfect. We can have a perfect character. We can have the character of Christ fully developed within us fully developed within us as we keep our focus on him. And that's why I keep uh, talking so much about praising God through his son, Jesus Christ, because that praising God is, is how we can keep our focus on God. Praising God praises him for who he is, and it keeps our focus uh, away from ourselves and on our heavenly father. Go ahead, Sister Maxine. Oh, I um, I forgot again. I, I usually write it down, but I'm so busy taking notes. Okay, no worries. You go ahead without me. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, as we move into our conclusion today, I want to really emphasize this idea of Jesus on the water. You know, another instance in the Bible of Jesus on the water is in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, when it says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17 tells us, now the Lord, speaking of Jesus, is that Spirit. And so the Spirit of God would be Jesus moving upon the face of the waters. What a beautiful thing for us to take our focus away from someone other than Jesus and look at Jesus, center our focus on him, turn our eyes upon Jesus so that we can look full in his wonderful face and so that the things of earth, everything other than the Father and his Son, will grow strangely dim. And so here we have two instances of Jesus being above the waters. Now, if the, we talked about the idea of a riverbank being a place of authority, it's where Pharaoh uh, worshiped in the mornings. It's where Moses, as a baby, was kept on the waters in the bulrushes at the bank of the river. Um, it is where the angels stood. And so all of these are beings of authority, and they were standing on the bank of the river. But now, then we see Jesus, the Son of God, the Spirit of God, hovering over the waters. So he's above the river banks. He's above the waters. And, and the waters symbolize danger and fear in our lives. And Jesus is above all of that. Jesus is above all of that. We've also seen that the river represents the Nile, which is the main symbol of Egypt. And Egypt represents slavery to sin. My friend, if Jesus is above the waters of the river, that means that he is there above in a position of authority, in a position of power over 
these things in your life and in my life. Jesus is above the fear in your life. Jesus is above the depression, the anxiety, uh, the trials, the questions, whatever is going on in your life, Jesus is above it all. And uh, in Val, if you are ready to sing for us now, I'd love for you to sing uh, the song Above All. I am ready. All right. Okay. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man. You were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone. You dare to die, rejected and alone. Like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall. And thought of me above all, above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man. You were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone. You live to die, rejected and alone. Like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me. Above all, you were crucified, laid behind the stone. You lived to die, rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me. Above all, like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me. Above all, amen. Praise God, amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what can we say? We have nothing to say in light of the great sacrifice that you, Father, made for us in giving up your son. Father, you were willing to give up your son forever. The being whom you loved most, you were willing to give him up for us. We will spend eternity trying to grasp this concept, trying to grasp your great love, the love that is not only what you do, but is who you are. And your son Jesus was trampled on the ground. He was beaten like Moses beat the water with his rod. Christ was stricken 
and the sheep and the sheep scattered. But Father, because you dove into that water, the water of our fear, the water of our depression, the water of our troubles and sorrows, the water of our humanity, the water of our weaknesses. Jesus, because you dove into that water, your Father has now elevated you above the water. And now you stand above all of those things, above all in our lives. You stand wrapped, fully clothed in righteousness. And now you offer to wrap us, to clothe us in your beautiful, beautiful righteousness. We ask for you to do that. Not only wrap us in your righteousness, but fill us with your righteousness. Fill us with your presence, Jesus Christ. We are so thankful for your opportunity, your, for your willingness to do that. And uh, for everything that you went to make that, to everything, everything you went through to make that possible. We thank you so much, Father. And Jesus, we give ourselves to you. And we pray in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for joining us today on Connect to Hope Fellowship. As I mentioned before, next week we will have a testimony Sabbath. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing uh, a testimony from our sister Brigitte. I think you will really enjoy it and be blessed by it. So I, I wish you uh, the presence of your Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, for this coming week.